All right, y'all, you're locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today I am joined by Mark Zeno of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. He's going to be talking with us about Arthur Smith's emotional reaction to this Falcons week one loss, as well as if there is more good than bad to take away from this week one loss to the New Orleans Saints. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. You're very humble host of this Locked on Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked on Sports Atlanta podcast family. In today's episode of Locked on Falcons is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. All you got to do is pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First-time users get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code code locked on that's pricepicks.com promo code locked on so guys we thank everyone that makes locked on falcons their first listen each and every day of course locked on falcons is free and available monday through friday on a variety of podcast platforms including apple odyssey google spotify and of course youtube make sure you subscribe to the locked on falcons youtube channel and you will get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops so today's episode i am joined by an illustrious guest and mark zeno the host of the a to z podcast one of the three shows on the locked on sports atlanta podcast family mark will be talking with us about arthur smith's sort of reaction uh you know sort of emotional walking out on the post uh, the post game presser and sort of what his reaction to that reaction was uh monday in his uh follow-up press conference as well as you know if there is more good to take uh from this week one loss than the bad stuff and we'll sort of get mark's thoughts on that we'll get some of my thoughts on, on that later in the episode we'll also uh talk a little bit about um, how the Falcons compare when it comes to blowing these third quarter leads um, to the rest of the league as well in today's episode. But without further ado, let's jump into that conversation with Mark Zeno of the AT of not of the Locked On Sports Atlanta uh, podcast right now. So, guys, you are here, Locked On Falcons, and I am joined by another illustrious guest, none other than Mark Zeno. You love him. You hate him. He Uh is the host of the A to Z podcast here on the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And I was telling Jarvis yesterday that I was tempting fate by asking you before the game to come on this podcast (laughs) that something crazy (laughs) was going to happen in week one here, Mark. But we have Mark here to share his thoughts on the Falcons week one. Welcome to the show, Mark. Iron, always a pleasure to be with you, brother. Uh, I have a feeling that you and I may fall into the whole category of, uh, if you and I agree on something, it's probably right deal today. So uh, away we go. All right. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, Arthur Smith's reaction to the game. You know, he sort of had a walkout uh, in his post-game presser. I thought you said a lot of poignant things uh, in your Monday morning episode of A to Z uh, about that and how, you know, there's some good, there's some bad with that. Uh, obviously, he had a chance to sort of talk about that a little bit as well in his Monday presser. So I'll just give you the floor, Mark, uh, to talk about what your thoughts on Arthur Smith and how he handled the this loss. Well, look, I, I mean, I have the benefit of of literally going to the press conference and asking Arthur Smith very pointed questions about not only what went on in the game, but his thoughts in the post-game press conference. So I might be a little bit more uh, reserved in my passion and my comments because it's, you know, in the context of hearing him react to it a second time. That said, uh, he chose a very sort of dangerous and slippery route after the game to bring up the fact that, quote, you know, we wrote the obituary, we had him labeled 45th, we, we buried this team. All those sort of, for lack of a better term, rabbit ear comments that, you know, you have put in your mental memory bank and decided to bring up after what looks like a carbon copy loss for the Falcons for the better part of the last decade. I mean, that's just kind of what generally the fan base is feeling. Now, in the context of, you know, what people write and what people say, I've said this, look, I my business is opinions, right? So I read everything everybody writes. 
I read your columns. I watch your show. I mean, everything that people are saying about the Falcons, I want to digest to get a sense of what people are and be able to react to it. I don't think anybody has been in this market particular. Maybe nationally they have, and they probably have. But in this market particular, I don't think anybody's been unfair to the Falcons. I don't think anybody in this market buried them or wrote their obituary, per se. I think people have been very level-headed about what this team is and what this team isn't going into the season, and the low expectations, I think, are fair. You have more dead cap space than anybody in NFL history has had walking into a season. Uh, you're on what is generally a backup quarterback as your starter with a rookie as a backup. You've got a whole bunch of bargain basement you know, free agents that you added throughout the offseason on one-year deals. This is not exactly a roster that many GMs, when they lay in bed at night thinking about what a dream roster looks like, would say the Falcons have done it right. All that put together, that doesn't mean the Falcons can't be good, and I think Arthur Smith has tried to harp on that. But in the same respect, you know, when you have those mental notes in your memory bank, you bring them up when you got to a place where nobody expected you to go. You don't bring them up after a place everybody expected you to go, which is blowing a 16-point lead in the fourth quarter in which you gave up 213 yards, 17 points, and still managed to hold on to the ball for nine minutes and 35 seconds. Like, that is the definition of blowing a lead if you ever were to write one. So when he did that, it was sort of like playing the media antagonist, I'm the protagonist sort of, you know, uh, relationship there. And it just was very off-putting and seemed almost, you know, not really uh, in tune with what, you know, Falcons fans and people feel. And and yes, it's not his responsibility to, to massage the fan base or anything like that. But taking this job with the Falcons means that you understand the history. You understand what they left on the table uh, in the Super Bowl and that you have to overcome that. That's that's part of this job, whether you like it or not. It's just like if the Steelers were to get rid of Mike Tomlin, the person coming in has to have a formidable defense. Like that's just part of the identity of the franchise. Um, and what, while that identity is good and being a team that chokes is an identity that's bad, if you want to flip the script on that, and we heard that your defensive coordinator, Dean Peace, talked so much about how they were going to change the culture around here. Well, that game fed into the culture as much as any other game we've seen in recent memory. You put all that together, I thought it was just a very bad look. And the only way out of the way he presented it was to go out and win ball games. Well, in case you haven't noticed, the Falcons' schedule gets pretty tough here in the coming weeks with the Rams, you know, and a whole bunch of other playoff teams from last year uh, and very good teams from this year, save Seattle coming up in week three. So all that aside, it was just a very weird pivot for Arthur Smith to take after the game. So I was very much, you know, not liking the position that he took and thought that it was a, a, an ill decision to do so. That said, let me shed a little light on it because at the post-game press conference today, I succinctly asked Arthur Smith very plainly, you know, after the game, you made reference to what people have wrote narratives and being buried and everything else. You know, what did that have to do with what went on in the fourth quarter? And he fired right back without hesitation. Hey, look, that was my emotions getting the better of me. That was me being emotional in the moment after a loss. I've got to be better. I could have handled it a lot better. And uh, all we can do is work from here to get better, you know, and move on. I thought that was a perfect answer. There's nothing else to say. I think he owned his emotions after the game, which is fair. Uh, I think he owned the fact that he could have handled it better. We did not. I don't think. I know he owned the fact that he could have handled that moment better. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll learn learn to do so going forward. And, and quickly turn the page. I, I think all of those responses are fair and they're accurate and they're the best response you can give in that moment. Because when you talk about, is this the right guy to lead this team? And is this the right guy to change the culture of the franchise? Having rabbit ears is not the way to do it. Uh, and and being sensitive about what people write and what people say is not the way to do it. Now, from the get-go, do I think he should have been like, I don't read what people say, I don't care what people say, I'm focused on what goes on in the building? Probably would have been a better thing than to acknowledge what everybody wrote about you along the way. Um, but still, I thought Arthur Smith was a pro today. I really did. Like, he felt very professional. He was almost humble. Like, when I asked the question, you could see, and, and maybe it's just his mannerisms, but I felt like his head dipped a little bit, and it was a way of just acknowledging, hey, I screwed up in that moment. It wasn't my best moment. I'm going to be better from there going on. It's on me to be able to handle the emotional state of this team after wins, after losses, after whatever. Uh, and I think he did that with a plum today, and I, I give him a lot of credit for the way he handled it. That said, Aaron, you know, what we're still harping on is post-game press conferences and reaction and the fourth quarter. The other three quarters are pretty darn good, and, and I hate to give those away. Yeah, you sort of have to because in the media world, that's what we do now. In the hot take world, that's what we do. You kind of have to give those away. But there were some pretty good things that happened yesterday that that I think are at least good building blocks going forward. Absolutely. And uh, we'll get into what are those good things are for this team as we continue today's episode here with Mark Zeno of the A to Z podcast. 
So guys, as I mentioned before, we got more to come here with Mark Zeno of the A to Z podcast, uh, giving his thoughts on whether or not there's going to be more good than bad to take away uh, from this week one loss. But before we get there, guys, I do want to tell you about Prize Picks, a fun way to play daily fantasy. All you got to do is pick two, two, five players. And if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win all as much as 10 times as much money on your entry. Last week, I had a triple play with Kyle Pitts, Josh Allen, and uh, Marcus Mariota going going over uh, and having more than their prize picks projections. Only two out of those three players uh, were able to win. I'll sort of scour uh, prize picks uh, to see sort of what is going to be my new triple play this week in week two. Uh, and, and you know, we'll see where that goes, but I haven't quite done the research yet. Uh, but as the week progresses, I'll give you guys an update on that. Um, but it's not just NFL projections. It's NBA, NHL, MLB, PGA, college football. You can find all that and more. Prize picks is safe. It's fast. It's easy. It's uh, available in over 30 states in the U.S. and Canada. And if you want to play to get in in this prize picks projections, all you got to do is download the app at you know, or go to Bryce Picks, prizepicks.com uh, and sign up. And if you use the promo code locked on, you'll get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. Uh, that means if you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you another $100 to play with. Again, don't forget that promo code locked on at sign up to get that instant deposit match up to $100. And guys, I want to tell you about a product I use every single day. It is from Athletic Group greens and it's called AG1. I started taking it uh, because I wanted to be healthier. And basically, I, you know, it's like taking a multivitamin, but you're not taking a thousand little pills each morning. It's just one scoop of AG1 with a cup of water first thing in the morning and your day starts off right. AG1 is a high quality product that has 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, adaptogens, all in the special in a uh, blend of ingredients that is going to help you improve your gut health. It's going to improve your nervous system, your immune system. It's going to boost your energy. It's going to give you that recovery and that focus that you need throughout the day. And you can reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition with AG1. And Athletic Greens is making it easy because they're going to give you a free year-long supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, as well as five free travel packs of AG1 with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash NFL network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NFL network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So I'm joined by Mark Zeno, of course, of the ADZ podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, along with ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste and hitting hard with John Chuckery. And of course, always make Locked On Sports Atlanta your first listen or your second listen, I'm sorry, after you've made Locked On Falcons your first listen. So, Mark, you, you talked about uh, the good things that came away from this Falcons performance in week three. And so my question is, yeah, we harped on some of the bad things. Obviously they stand out in the fourth quarter, but do you take away more good from this week one performance from the Falcons than you say bad things? I mean, I do look, if I had told you Aaron going into that game, the Falcons are going to have four sacks. They were going to rush for 200 yards and Marcus Marietta wasn't going to throw an interception. Forget what the final outcome was going to be. You would have said, yes, take it. That's what we've been lusting for, right? Like that's, that's the game we've wanted them to play sort of mistake-free football. Now, Mariota did have a fumble, but he didn't throw an interception. But if, you, you, if I told you those three things were going to happen, you'd be doing back, you'd be doing backflips. I mean, it, it's just, it's what we've wanted. So is there reason to believe that that could continue? Yeah. Are the Saints one of the better defenses in the league? Absolutely. Are the Rams one of the better defenses in the league? Sure they are. Can the Falcons duplicate that performance? We'll find out, but at least it's a building block to go forward. I really thought that it was a, a, a very well-played game by the Falcons, for three quarters. And, you know, here we are again with this team, like in this sense of taking a step forward and two steps backward. But, you know, if you ignore the good things that went on in the game, you're almost not respecting the fact that they're in a rebuild and that there's a process to this. And I'll say it again, Aaron, because I said it with you before, this isn't year one of the rebuild. It's year zero. This year is a wasted year. You have more dead cap than any other team in NFL history. So this doesn't count as a year that you're actually supposed to be able to be highly competitive. And for three quarters, maybe three quarters plus, they were highly competitive in a game against a good team. 
yeah, I think that's the right approach uh, to take from this game. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the things that went right for them. Zero sacks allowed. I, I've never seen the Falcons not give up a sack to the Saints, it feels like, in my entire lifetime. Um, and so I do think your, your your point is dead on where this is a rebuilding year. And it's not, you know, in, it's easy to say this in, in August. Obviously, now we're in September to be like, well, the wins and losses don't really matter. Um, it's more about this team's ability to play well and and to be able to put together good game plans to feel like this team is building something obviously now you know after week one in the way that it ended it does you know that feels kind of hollow or a moral victory or whatever but i think your point is is fair that you know given that this is a rebuilding team you you'd like to see the team close out some of these games but at the same time like there is a lot of good to take away from this week one performance Absolutely. And and I don't want fans to get lost on that because I, I want fans to understand that the goal for this year isn't necessarily to win games. It's to be competitive in games, to not get blown out. Like, I think that is a bigger, a lot of us would feel like, hey, I would have rather lost 40 to 10 in this game and never been in it. Right. That's like a general sentiment of Falcons fans. Like that would have been an easier loss to swallow to the Saints than what happened. But that's not what you want. I mean, I said repeatedly. I'm prepared for this team to have leads in the third quarter or be in the game down by a score like three or seven. And then the score ended up being, hey, they lose by 14 or they lose by 17 because it gets away from them in the fourth quarter. Why does it get away from them in the fourth quarter? Because they're not as talented as other teams. That's just objectively a fact. And I'm not sitting here burying the team or, or ranking them 45th out of 32 teams, which is really interesting. Um, but, but objectively, when you go player for player, one through 11 on offense, one through 11 on defense, and one through 53 on a roster, most of the teams that are going to play are going to have an edge in certain positions. Um, and so from that standpoint, I want them just to be competitive in games. And, and they did that in week one. They, they had a, a lead. They, they built a lead. Um, yet working on closing out games is a part of coaching. It's, a, it's what defines good coaches versus great coaches, right? I mean, go look at Mike Zimmer in Minnesota for years. He's been in a ton of games lost them all on bad kicks and everything else down the stretch, and the guy gets fired. I mean, that's not a bad coach. It's just a coach who can't close out games. If you can't close out games, you're not going to have a job long anywhere. And if you're in sales, you can't close deals, you're not going to have a job very long. So that's all part of this whole thing. Um, and you know me, I'm not like Pollyanna about anything in life. <laughs> so the idea that I'm sitting here looking at the positives from the Falcons and trying to take them away because – all I really needed to do was hear Arthur Smith say what he said today. And I'm like, good. It's back to what I thought he was. He's a good coach. You know, he knows how to prep his team. He knows how to be prepared for a game. And they showed that. Um, when they come out in a game and they're down 21-3 in a heartbeat, that shows lack of preparation. Because nobody in the NFL is that much outclassed by anybody else. You're just getting beat with scheme and getting beat with execution and getting beat everywhere. And that leads to preparation. That didn't happen in this week. And that's really what I want to see next week. They may lose to the Rams. They may lose by double digits. But if it kind of goes down the same way it went down in a sense where it's a tight game for three quarters or three and a half quarters and they lose in the end, I'm okay with that. Given this roster, I am okay with that loss. And I think Falcons fans have to understand that in the rebuild process, this is step one. Go look at what happened to Matt Ryan yesterday in the Colts and the Houston Texans, a team that I'm high on this year. They're going to be a lot more competitive. They were very competitive towards the end of last year. And if you can be competitive in games, then when you get to that point, your 60 million in cap space that you're going to have next year is like, okay, let's get one or two guys that can help us close out games. Let's get one or two pivotal players that are going to make the difference, that are going to make a stop, that are going to make a big play that will preserve wins for us as opposed to being on the wrong side of them. So I'm pleased with the competitive level of this team through one week of football. Obviously, there's a lot left. We can't make any grand conclusions one way or another. But this is still, I think, results aside, as somebody who's a process over results guy, I think step one in the process was very good. I think that's a, a perfect way of putting it, Mark. And I really appreciate you uh, joining me. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are like, Mark Zeno being the voice of reason here. What is going on in this world? There, but... there are crazier things that have been known to happen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but Mark, I, I, again, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights uh, into these topics. Let the people know what you got for them on A to Z in the coming days and weeks. All right. Now, we will react more to Arthur Smith as well. Um, can the Braves not choke too? Because, you know, we, we, we don't need that after they won a World Series. So uh, we got a lot going on here in Atlanta. And, and 
It's a long football season, folks. It's a very long football season. I'll remind you, the Eagles last year started out two and five and somehow found their way into the postseason. And that wasn't a very talented roster last year either. And I'm not saying the Falcons are going to make the playoffs, but you have to take a 30,000 foot view with this team. You can't get caught up in, in the small things. I get the, the, the come from behind losses and, and blowing leads is mind numbingly frustrated to this fan base. I'm not saying don't be frustrated about it, but I'm saying from a 30,000 foot view, um, you look at a, a big step was taken yesterday. Absolutely. So, guys, we still got more to come on today's episode. We'll talk a little bit uh, about the Falcons' ability to retain leads compared to some other teams. I know a listener wanted me to address that on a subject. So there's more to come as we wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. But again, appreciate Mark for joining me on today's episode. Make sure you check out A to Z tomorrow to get Mark's thoughts on Arthur Smith, as well as all the other things going on in Atlanta sports, as well as elsewhere in the country. So guys, as I said earlier, there's more to come on today's episode, but before we get there, I do want to tell you about the number one source for all your odds, lines, and games, whether you're looking for live in-game betting, scores, a podcast, I'm talking about betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports and football betting needs, and whether it's NFL, college football, MLB, NHL, NBA, combat sports, esports, golf, uh, BetOnline has it all. And if you're looking to, you know, take your one and oh, uh, you know, winnings from the Falcons being able to cover that five and a half point uh, spread uh, against the Saints last week, as I recommended for you guys, uh, you want to put that on the Falcons in week two, uh, you should know that they're uh, 10 point underdogs to the Rams, which means that, you know, that line has moved about three points since the summer where earlier the Falcons were 13 point underdogs. So that usually indicates that Vegas feels better about the Falcons uh, as well as probably worse about the Rams. But if you want to put your money on that game, I'm leaning towards putting the money on the Falcons as well. Uh, Head on over to betonline.net today or use your mobile device to sign up to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. So we're wrapping up today's episode, answering a question from uh, Taewon at Teflon Wan on Twitter. He asked, can you talk about this on the podcast and how this compares to other teams? And the, this that he's referring to is a tweet that Mike Conti, our good friend from 92.9 The Game at Mike Conti 929 put out Monday morning. He posted a tweet that said the Falcons record in games where they've led at the end of the third quarter is 66 and 18 since 2012. That's a 78.5 win percentage uh, since the start of 2020. It's 10 and six, which is a 62 and a half uh, percent win percentage. So when I looked this up, uh, Juan uh, Taiwan um, at pro football reference, I had the Falcons record, at, or at least I looked it up at uh, pro football reference, sorry. Um, and they were 62 and 16 since 2012, which is a win percentage of 79.5%. So slightly off Mike's uh, numbers, but the, the since 2020 is accurate. Uh, and that win percentage since 2012 is t- 23rd in the NFL. The league average over that span is about 84% wins uh, in these games where you're up by one or more points after three quarters. Uh, that would be about league average. So the Falcons are about three games below league average over the last decade. Now, since 2012, that 10 and six record is the second worst in the NFL. The Lions are the only team that's worse than that. Uh, I mean, gone five, three and one since then with a 61% win percentage. Percentage. And, you know, the league average in that span is about 85% um, as well. So the Falcons are about 3.6 wins below average, right? So three or four games. And I think it's easy to sort of point out that three, at least three games that the Falcons should have won, you know, six of those um, with those six losses, three of them have been where the Falcons have led by a field goal or less, right? And the three that they led by more than that at the end of three quarters were the Dallas game in 2020, the Bears game in 2020, and this most recent Saints game. They were up by five at the end of three against Dallas, uh, having who erased a 19-point halftime lead for the Falcons. But then the Falcons scored 10 points at the beginning of the fourth quarter to go up 15 before blowing that lead. And of course, they were up 16 against the Bears and then 13 against uh, the Saints this past Sunday. And then extending that to 16 uh, at the beginning of the fourth quarter. So you take away those three. If the Falcons don't blow those three games, I I certainly think not to sit here and say the narrative about the team blowing uh, leads goes away because we still have, of course, that one game from several years ago that people love to remind us of. Um, But certainly it doesn't feel like it's as common as it it seems. And you would basically look at these numbers and say, hey, you know, they blow leads about on average what an average NFL team would do if you just take away those three games in particular. Um, 
Now, the final thing we're going to touch upon on today's episode is talking about some of the good things that the Falcons did do to sort of piggyback on what uh, Zeno was talking about. Um, and, you know, I, I did rewatch the television copy of the first half of the game again. And one of the things that Arthur Smith pointed out in his Monday presser was how good the team handled the end of the first half situation. I, I would agree with that because that's not something that has been too frequent and consistent in recent years, it always seems like defense is, is giving up points in the four minute drill or the two minute drill. They were able to force two punts. I think a large part due to their pass rush being able to create pressure in those situations in large part due to Grady Jarrett. And the, the fact is one of the good things, even though uh, four sacks looks great, they didn't provide a huge amount of pressure, but they did get more pressure in this Saints game than they did in most games last year. They provided 30 percent pressure on, you know, or Jameis Winston was pressured on 30 percent of his 40 dropbacks. And, you know, I figure the to me, the, the normal amount of pressure that you should get in an NFL game is somewhere around 33, 35 percent pressure. And last year, the Falcons only were able to reach that number in two games. That was the Giants and the Jets game. They weren't able to eclipse 30% in any other game last year, although you can round up the 29.7% they had in the second Panthers game to 30%. Um, and so the fact that the Falcons were able to at least get more pressure in this game than they had done for most of last year, uh, to me, is a testament. Now, I will say one knock I would say is I think they were probably still too reliant on Grady Jarrett to provide all that pressure. We did see some positive uh, rushes from, you know, Arnold Ebiketti and Lorenzo Carter, but, you know, this is why you got to get more Grady Jarrett, more help. But we'll we'll save the the, the Jalen Carter, Will Anderson conversation uh, for the future uh, when we're talking about what we need to add this offseason. I don't think that's news to anybody. But, um, you know, I do think the fact that the Falcons were able to get points in their four-minute offense and two-minute offense at the end of the half um, you know, they, they got their one explosive play, uh, you know, in, in the final minute of the half on that 31 yard play uh, to Drake London. So I think that's a positive. And uh, the other last thing I will say is I do think the fact that this game went the way that the Falcons wanted to go uh, is also a positive when we're talking about process over results. You know, this was something I talked about the reverse of where the Lions last year dictated that game. Uh, for the most part, that game went exactly how the Lions wanted to go. They just weren't able to close it out. Uh, and, and the same can be said about the Falcons. And, and so that's something that they need to work on. But the fact is that, you know, we haven't seen too many games. Over, I can't recall too many games where it's like, hey, this game went exactly how the Falcons wanted to go. Being able to control the, the, the ball, uh, line of scrimmage, all that stuff. Uh, so I think that is a, a very positive, and we'll see if the Falcons can continue that in future games or if this is just kind of a one off. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that's something that we'll just sort of have to see when it comes to the idea of this team being able to not finish games. Again, I think some of that, a lot of that is owed to the pass rush and we'll sort of see what the all 22, if that confirms that notion, but it kind of goes back to something you've heard me talk about this off season, kind of confirming, you know, a narrative that you've heard me push uh, as, as I want to do, but like, you know, one of the things I stated all off season was like, it's a lot easier to finish games when you're going up against Tim Boyle than it is against Matt Stafford and why the Falcons blew that lead against the lions. They couldn't finish that game in 2020 when they were facing Stafford, but were able to hold on to that thing uh, against Tim Boyle. And I think the same applies now when you look back at the saints game where T Trevor Simeon l guided this team on a comeback, um, last year, but the Falcons were able to finish that game. And it's a lot easier to do that against a third string quarterback like Trevor Simeon than it is against, you know, Jameis Winston. Um, and so I think that's a part of it. And again, I think being better pass rush will, will help alleviate some of those issues as well. But, you know, I, I do feel like there is positive there for this Falcon team that, you know, rather than just simply looking at it, Hey, this mojo that this coaching staff had was the reason why they were able to overachieve last year, which is a narrative you've heard me push back several times again. I do think the fact that they were able uh, to sort of dictate things to me is much more an indication of good coaching and good preparation, as Mark put it, than it is, Hey, they, they were able to finish a game against Tim Boyle. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, even though it, it kind of, pushes a narrative, I, I would spin it that way where it's like, that's something that I think you can look at as that's really good coaching as opposed to, Hey, they were able to not let Tim Boyle beat them on the last second throw, uh, as an indicator of good coaching. So that is something I do think if, you know, for all of you 
that had been pushing back against that narrative that I've been pushing of, uh, you know, Arthur Smith not doing a great job coaching last year. You know, that is something I do think you can take away from this week one game, even if there were some missteps in, in terms of game management at the end of the game uh, where that Arthur Smith may want back and Dean Pease may want back as well. So I, I would I would take that as a as a positive as opposed to just automatically going to these guys are bad coaches because they mismanaged the game late in the game, which, you know, I, I think it's fair to criticize them for. But I wouldn't necessarily look too hard at that. But um, that's where we'll leave it, guys. And um, you will do a Q&A tomorrow as hopefully we'll get access to the all 22 in time usually is usually a day late week one most years. So we'll see if the NFL is on time this week uh, and we'll answer your questions. If you have questions, you can submit them via Facebook or Twitter at lockdown Falcons. You can send an email to lockdown Falcons at mail.com, or you can leave a comment here on the lockdown Falcons YouTube channel. Uh, and there's going to be a fifth way in which you could provide your feedback to me on this podcast is I meant to talk about this on yesterday, uh, but because of all the stuff that happened on Sunday, kind of got distracted, but uh, we're, we're launching a discord server here for locked on Falcons. So that will be another way where you guys can interact. And this is the first time I've ever sort of ran a discord server. So, you know, if there's any hiccups there, uh, you know, uh, you know, just know it's a learning process for me as well there, but that will be a great way for not only you guys to interact with me, um, but also interact with, each other, uh, chat and, and talk about these things. And, and the, my hope is that we'll kind of do like a, a Saturday symposium is what I'm kind of calling it, where we can, it's kind of like a Twitter space where we can have, you know, we can talk, you know, for like an hour or Saturday afternoon or whatever each week, uh, to sort of, you know, just chat about the Falcons or chat about what other things. And, you know, we can, you know, Stan, Will, Will Anderson and Jalen Carter as well in Discord, so all that sort of stuff. So uh, that should be something that I think, you know, many of you are into. I'll, I'll leave a link to where you can sign up for that in the description uh, here on YouTube and elsewhere on your preferred podcast platform. So uh, keep an eye out for that if you're looking to join that. Uh, but that will do it for us here, guys. Really appreciate you guys for making Locked on Falcons your first listen. For your second listen, check out the Peacock and Williamson podcast, the flagship show covering all of uh, the 32 teams in the NFL on here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. And of course, you can find Peacock and Williamson on YouTube or wherever you get your 